Hi everybody, this is James Tompkins and welcome to the third lecture in the International Finance Series. And today we're going to talk about free trade. Now first thing I want to do is say, hey, why, even we, oh, why are we even talking about free trade? Well, what's the overall theme of this class? What is the, the one thing I said that anything we discuss in this course has to relate to this overall broad theme? Sort of our lighthouse. International financial principles as it affects firm value. And value is a function of what two things? Risk and return. And what element of risk are we discussing in the first half of this class that one might associate more with international than, say, domestic? Exchange rate risk. And so we're going to spend the first half of this semester understanding why the dollar goes up and down in value. And we'll use that as a benchmark to look at other exchange rates. And then we'll look at managing that risk, not only in the short term, but the long term. And, and taking advantage of risk opportunities that exist out there. So why free trade today? Well, because by the time we finish today, part of what we'll be discussing is going to relate to the value of the dollar. In fact, we're going to get into a trading situation. And here's a quick question for you. When we get into this trading situation, do you think it's going to depend on the existence of currency? Or do you think the value of the currency will be an outcome of the trading? Hence the latter. We're going to find out that the value of the currency is an outcome, not a condition of the trading. So, so the reason we're doing what we're doing today is our goal is to understand why the dollar goes up and down in value. And this is the first topic, if you will, that is related to that. So let me begin with an agenda. And we'll start off with a, a free trade discussion, just broad, general free trade discussion. And then I'm going to get into a very, very simple example. And, and the goal of this example will be to address the question, does free trade, on average, benefit society? And of course, we'll delve deeper into that discussion, but that's just part of the agenda. And then the other part is there'll be other free trade issues that crop up as we get into this. So let me begin with this question. What is free trade? Is it trade that's free? Cost nothing? Well, what happens when you trade? You just exchange stuff, right? And of course, here we're talking about in the concept of an international class. And so free trade is essentially where you can trade without any market frictions, if you will. I mean, let, let me give you an example. I live in a neighborhood where if I turn right out of my neighborhood, right down the road, less than a mile away maybe, that there's a Publix where I can go shopping. And if I turn left... Also about a mile down the road, there used to be another place where I could go shopping, also Publix. Now, as far as shopping at one versus the other, and they're all within the same county and same township and so on and so forth, does it matter where I shop? Will I pay higher taxes or will there be quotas or will there be different government regulations? Does, does any of that is any of that a factor? And it's not, right? And essentially, that's what free trade is. You know, basically, free trade is when, when you engage in commercial activities that where borders essentially become irrelevant. So there are no market frictions. There are, there are no uh, tariffs or, or quotas or anything like that just because of the fact that a particular product or a particular service or whatever it is has crossed a border. Can you think of any free trade agreements? Of course, people always say NAFTA, you know, even though that was passed years ago, I think 92 or something like that. Um, NAFTA seems to be the most famous one that people always think of. And yeah, that was a free trade agreement between Canada and the United States and Mexico. And so, so here's my question for you. Let's just take NAFTA. 
Was that truly a free trade agreement, or is it fair to say that it was a freer trade agreement? In other words, as soon as that that motion, that bill was passed, did, did all of a sudden tariffs go to zero? They didn't, right? In reality, a lot of these quote-unquote free trade agreements that exist among countries are really freer trade agreements. So let's get into the why. You know, I told you in this class our goal is not just, well, that's interesting, let's, let's understand why. And so let's say that prior to NAFTA, and I'm just making up this number, that oranges or, or tomatoes that crossed from Mexico into the United States, let's say that they were subject to a, a, a 15% tariff, which means a 15% tax just because something crossed the border. Now, on an overnight basis, NAFTA's passed, would that go, boom, straight down to zero? It wouldn't, right? What would be more likely? Well, what would be more likely is that they gradually, over a period of years, go down to zero. Now, now why, why do it gradually? Well, are businesses going to have to adjust to the new regulatory environment? They are, right? And would you rather that they be subject to economic shock or that they can strategically uh, change how they're going to conduct business? Which one would be a more economically efficient way to make the adjustment? Just sudden overnight change or, or give businesses time to adjust? And presumably the latter, right? And that's how it was with NAFTA. Okay, the Na NAFTA... Um, and I, I don't recall how, how many years, and it could easily vary by product and so on and so forth. But, but NAFTA was phased in over a, a long, relatively long period of time. So bottom line is, what we're looking at is freer trade agreements for the most part. So here's something that you've probably seen in your... Uh, economics classes, you know, inputs, land, labor, capital, and outputs, goods, and services. And, and when you think of a, a freer trade agreement, of everything that you see there, goods, services, land, labor, capital, what do you typically think of that they apply to? Well, if you're like me, you think, you think goods, right? I mean, the chances are that you know, if you're watching this online, you, you look around at your desk or wherever you're watching this, or even what you're wearing, chances are that that is a good that crossed a border. Maybe it came over from China or whatever. And so to the extent that there was a, a, a tariff, whether it's stuff that we're importing or stuff that we're exporting, you know, typically, or at least I, I tend to think of freer trade agreements of applying to, to goods and, and then to some degree services also. But in reality, at least conceptually, could you apply free trade agreements not to just goods and services, but to, but to the inputs? So for example, when you look at the inputs right here, what, what, what seems to be a political hot button? Well, what about the, if you will, free trade of labor? What do we call that? What do we refer that to? That, that whole debate, what do we refer that? How, how do we refer to that? Immigration, right? I mean, if a, if a person from Mexico was free to just pick up and head to the United States and, and work in the United States without any red tape, and the, the border was irrelevant, that would be the equivalent of free trade of labor. I mean, if, if I look at my finance degree, in the same way that I'm free to pick up from here in Georgia and say, go teach in Texas, you know, that's what we're talking about when it comes to immigration. So, so labor is transferable across borders. What about capital? Is capital transferable across borders? By that, I mean money. It is, right? At what speed? The speed of light. So, you know, free or trade agreements, in, in principle, could also apply to capital. In fact, in fact what, what do we call it when a country says, uh, no, uh, you, you, there are going to be restrictions on, on taking capital out of our country 
or, or maybe even restrictions on letting them in. I mean, conceptually, it applies both ways, but typically one thinks of it in the other direction. They call it capital controls, right? That there are some countries, uh, I mean, China's been facing this out and becoming freer and freer with their capital, but it, it's kind of like Hotel California, right? You can check in, but you can never leave, or you, or you can't leave as freely as you might otherwise like to with your money, that is. But in any case, capital is transferable across borders. So, so therefore, you, you could apply conceptually freer trade agreements to capital. What about land? Is land transferable across borders? Could I pick up a five-star hotel room in, in Manhattan and, and transport it to Thailand? I couldn't, right? However, what characteristic of land is transferable across borders? Ownership, right? So the bottom line is that, yeah, we might typically think of these freer trade agreements as referring to primarily goods and maybe goods and services. But in principle, they could also apply to the free movement of land, labor, and capital. And so, of course, the inputs, or at least characteristics of those inputs, are also transferable across borders. So, what I want to do now is go through an incredibly simple example. In fact, the example is going to be so simple that we're going to be cynical about it later on. We're going to challenge the simplicity of this example, and, and can we even apply it to real life? But the goal of this simple example is going to be to address some of these questions. You know, does free trade on average benefit society? In your opinion, is this topic, oh yeah, it's a no-brainer, or is it fiercely debated? Well, just to give you an idea, and again, you know, anything I say in this course where it's a fact, you need to check that, okay? Not maybe the logic, but the facts. So as I recall, NAFTA was just split right down the middle in the Senate. And, and, and when it's split, the vice president makes the tie. And, and I think that's how NAFTA happened. And, uh, and that's how close NAFTA got to being passed or not passed. So, so we'll, we'll ask, well, why? Why is this topic so fiercely debated? Can this example that we get into, can it apply risk realistically to real life? I mean, is, or is it just too oversimplistic? And of course, what is the exchange rate implication? Yeah, that's the reason for doing what we're doing today, right? That it's just another cog in understanding why the dollar goes up and down in value. And and if you, I don't know if you agree with this statement, but is your perception that in general environmentalists tend to oppose free trade? Well, probably some do, and and some don't. But to the extent that some do, you know, why? And and what would be a counter argument? Again, you know, my goal in this class with any topic is not to get you to be, hey, I'm pro-free trade or I'm anti-free trade or whatever. I, I just want you to, to understand logically, not emotionally, but logically, the issues that exist, and then you make up your own mind. So, so with this example, like I said, you know, our goal is, does free trade on average benefit society? Now, what I often do in class at, at, at this point is take a vote. But in fairness, when you look at that question, is that an ambiguous question? It is, right? And, and why, what, what is ambiguous about it? You know, does free trade on average benefit society? Well, there's probably a, a number of things. If you look at that sentence, I mean, we, we've defined free trade, right? What about all of this stuff on average benefit society? So, for example, have we defined benefit? Well, can you think of any benefit or a way to measure benefit that people would pretty much almost close to 100% or way up there in the 90s say, yeah, yeah, if, I, if this measure goes up, then then that's a benefit. Can you think of anything like that? Well, you might say, well, if I make more money, right? 
But what if you make more money? Let, let's say free trade happens and that results in you making more money. What if, what if prices go up by an even greater amount than the money, extra money that you're making? Is, is that is that happy face or sad face? That's sad face, right? So it's it's not good enough just to say make more money. What, what else? What else would we? Or what would be something that would overcome the point that I just made? What if prices rise higher? Well, what about standard of living? Is, is there anyone watching this right now that would rather have a lower versus higher standard of living? I mean, ceteris paribus. I mean, think about the, you know, m m maybe you have a car. Well, what if, what if you didn't have a car and, and, and somebody said, hey, you can either have this car or you can have this bicycle. And you can only choose one. Well, you probably, may, maybe not, I could be wrong. You probably used, you know, have the car. And what if somebody said, hey, you can, you can live in this house with running water and electricity and, and, and dishwasher and laundry machine and all that kind of stuff. Or you can live in this mud hut that doesn't even have running water. Okay, chances are most people would take a car. I mean, all right, ready for another sea story? Remember, I promised you the odd sea story. I, I remember when I was a cadet on a ship. So this would have been the, the, the late 70s. And our ship pulled into, um, it was a port near Odessa in, in Russia, uh, Ilochevsk, as I recall. And anyway, uh, I was asked to go speak to students at the University of Odessa. They just wanted to see how, you know, I guess my accent or whatever, a, a non-Russian accent. So, so I spoke to the English class. And, and what kind of questions do you think they asked me? Do you think they asked me about our political system? Do you think they asked me about, you know, who, who was in office and and differences between capitalism and socialism? No. I got questions like, um, hey, do you know Paul McCartney? And uh, where'd you get those genes from? And I guess it's, to me, it's just kind of a, a cute way of illustrating that pretty much no matter what culture you transcend, at least my experience is that, ceteris paribus, people would rather have a higher versus lower standard of living. I remember one time being up this jungle river where we were unloading, I think it was Malaysia, and we were, um, we were picking up broomsticks, as I recall. And, and literally, the ship was at anchor in the river, and the natives would uh, you know, come alongside the ship, and they would basically live on what's called the fantail, which is at the stern or the back of the ship. And, and camped out there for a week. And, and none of them spoke English except for the, the foreman. He spoke a little bit of English. And he's the guy that I would interact with uh, because that, that was my job. I interacted with the locals. And I remember after a week, you know, I wanted to give him something. Well, I, I, I had an old pair of jeans. And, and here's a, a 35-year-old man, I'm guessing, maybe 40. And at the end of the week, I gave him this pair of jeans, and he burst into tears. He was so happy for this pair of jeans. And, and so, anyway, so may, maybe that's a, a, just a long way of saying, well, let's, let's measure benefit by standard of living. So if we agree on that, then what two pieces of information do we need to define standard of living? Well, if we have prices and we have wages, then what we could do is we could say, all right, well, if I work for one hour, say I make $10 an hour, then I can buy one radio. Let's say a radio costs $10. So with that kind of thought process, can we def you know, does that basically define standard living? It does, right? So let, let's get into the example. And what I'm going to do, again, it's really simplistic, and since everyone always seems to think of NAFTA, is I'm going to assume two trading partners, USA and Mexico. And I'm going to assume only two goods, food and electronics. And I'm, I'm going to assume that prices consist of two-thirds of labor, and then one-third is everything else. So capital and profit and so on and so forth. 
Okay. Now, by the way, so far, is, is any of this realistic? Are, are there only two countries in the world and are there only two goods? It's not, right? And so that, that's my point. What, why am I, you know, why are we even bothering with a, with a super simple example if it's not real world? Well, we're going to see how the world works, if you will, with just these very simplistic assumptions. But then later on, we'll challenge these assumptions. And, and we'll look at whether our conclusions can reasonably be parallel, if you will, the real world. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to make up some productivity. And so let's say in the US of A that they can make food at the rate of two pounds per hour. And Mexico, they're not quite as, as good at making food, only 0.4 pounds per hour. And let's say electronics... 0.04 units per hour. And, and again, Mexico, they're, they're not quite as good. You know, they're, they're only 0.03 units per hour. And by the way, if you compare the 2 to the 0.4, the USA would be said to be how many times more efficient at producing food? 5, right? Because 2 divided by 0.4 is 5. But, and, and what about electronics? Well, only 1.3 times more efficient. So in both cases, the U.S. seem to be better farmers, and, and, and maybe they've got robotics and stuff for making electronics. So in both cases, they, they seem to be more efficient, the U.S., than Mexico. And, and, and that's something we'll revisit later on, just to make a note about that. So here's what we're going to do. Basically, I'm going to make up some wage rates and prices, etc., before free trade. We're going to go from one extreme to the other. Imagine no trade is allowed at all, and, and we'll have wages and prices, and, and we'll look in both countries, hey, if I work for one hour in the U.S., I can buy this much bread and, and this, these many radios, and, and if I'm in Mexico and I work one hour, I can buy this much bread and, and this many radios, okay? And then we'll pass a free trade law. And after we pass a free late trade law, do you think, and we'll get into the logic of this in a minute, but what does your intuition tell you? Does your intuition tell you that wages and prices will be static or that they will probably change? Well, they'll probably change, right? And if they change, does that mean the standard of living will change? It does, right? So what we'll do is we'll pass a free trade law, and then with the new wages and prices, which will also be based on logic, by the way, but with the new wages and prices, then we'll see Oh, hey, um, how uh, you work for an hour, then how much can you buy? You know, can you buy more bread than before or less bread than before and so on and so forth, okay? And, and by the way, when, if I go back to that sentence, we, we didn't look at the rest of the ambiguity, my apologies, but does free trade on average benefit society? Society will define as not just the U.S. and not just Mexico, but both. And when it comes to the on average, is it fair to say that when, when any law is passed, that everyone is a winner or they're typically winners and losers? Presumably they're typically winners and losers. So that's why I have the on average there. Okay, On, on average are their net winners, however you choose to measure that, whether that's in terms of number of people or currency or whatever. Obviously there's judgment involved. Okay, so... So let's make up some wage rates before free trade. So assume that, say, in the U.S., you work for an hour and you make $8. And in Mexico, you work for an hour and you make 8 pesos. So with that information and the productivity table, we can basically calculate the labor cost per unit. So just remember, we'll do it with the $8 an hour. Just, just remember this one right here, $8 per hour. Okay, and, and we'll do it with food. Okay, so eight dollars of, of labor in the US produces how many pounds of food? Two pounds, right? So eight dollars of labor, maybe I'll make this clear. Eight dollars of labor, excuse me one minute, produces two pounds of food. So eight, so eight dollars of labor produces two pounds of food. 
So how many dollars of labor produces one pound of food? Well, four dollars, right? So, so basically, we have we basically have the the, the labor component of all this stuff. You know, if I, so, what what we're going here for labor will be four dollars a pound. So I could apply the same logic everywhere else, and it would look like that. Okay. Now. Do you recall, by, by assumption, if we again just focus on this $4 a pound, you know, what percentage was that of the total price? So we said the $4 per pound, or the labor component, represented two-thirds, correct? So if $4 a pound represents two-thirds of the price, then what is the whole price? What would I do this $4? Well, I'd multiply it by 3 over 2, right? And so therefore, here I have prices, $6 per pound. So we've got prices before free trade, no trade allowed, we've got prices, we've got wages. Okay, so in the US, for example, they make $8 an hour. So with that information, can we essentially figure out standard living? In other words, hey, work one hour, how much food can I buy? Work one hour, how many electronics can I buy? I can, right? So, for example, let's take, again, the U.S. worker. They make $8. Can they buy more or less than one pound of food? Food costs $6. Well, they can buy more, right? I mean, they could buy one pound, then they'd have $2 and change. And that $2 and change, how many pounds would that buy? They'd buy another third, right? So 8 divided by 6, or 1.33 pounds. So with that same logic, okay, could we do it for all the other boxes? We could, right? And so here, here's essentially our, our standard living chart before free trade, okay? We could, um, in the U.S., work one hour and buy this much bread and, and these many radios. And, and in Mexico, does it look like the standard living is as high? Doesn't look that way, right? They, they, they can't buy quite as much uh, food or quite as many electronics. So what we'll do now is we'll pass a free trade law. And so when we pass the free trade law, meaning so we're going from one extreme where the government says, no, nope, no trade allowed. U.S., you produce your stuff and sell your stuff to yourself. And same with you, Mexico. And, and now, hey, have at it. You guys, you trade away if you want to. So, is that going to happen? Will the U.S. and Mexico necessarily trade? Well, they may or they may not, right? What, what, what would motivate you, for example, to sell something, anything, to someone else? Let's say you have a, 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 a beautiful pen. What would motivate you to sell this pen to someone else? Well... Presumably, if the, if the price was right, right? And, and what would motivate someone to buy that pen from you? Same thing, right? Presumably, if the price was right. So in other words, is it fair to say that trade will happen if it's a win-win situation? In other words, if it's profitable on both sides? And presumably, that's true. At least that's what we're going to assume. Okay, we'll assume that trading happens if it's, pros if it's profitable. And what we'll do is we'll look at both an American and a Mexican entrepreneur, because after all, we, we define society as not just U.S. citizens, but also Mexican citizens. So we'll start off with the American entrepreneur. So the American buys a thousand pounds of food in the U.S. Now, if, if you recall, the price of food in the U.S. was six dollars a pound. So an American buys a thousand pounds. So so how, how many dollars would that be? That would be $6,000, right? So what are they going to do with that food? Well, they're not going to sell it in the U.S. because they just bought it, right? So where would they sell it? Assuming all this is profitable. Well, presumably they'd take it to Mexico and sell it. And if you recall... The price of the food in Mexico was 30 pesos per pound. 
So they have a thousand pounds, they get 30 pesos per pound. So how many pesos will they get for that food? Well, 30,000 pesos. Now, what's the only thing that he or she can now do with those pesos? Well, you might say change into dollars, right? But, but have we said anything about an exchange rate? We haven't, right? In fact, we're going to find out that the exchange rate is not a condition of all this trading, but an outcome. So given that, they've just, they've just you know, sold food. So are they going to turn around and buy the food back again? They're not, right? So what's the only thing they can do with that money then? Well, buy electronics. And given the price of the electronics in, in, in Mexico at 400 pesos per unit, it turns out that 30,000 pesos will buy you 75 units. 75 times 400 comes to 30,000 pesos. So what do you think they're going to do with those electronic units? Are they going to sell them in Mexico? No, they just bought them in Mexico. So where, will, where are they going to sell them? Presumably to the U.S., right? And so at the price in the U.S., which is $300 per unit, they get $22,500. So if we look at all this activity, the $6,000 that they bought, cash inflow or outflow? Outflow, right? Then they, they sell the food and, and they get 30,000 pesos, inflow or outflow? Inflow. But then they use all those pesos to buy the electronics, which is a cash inflow or outflow? Outflow, right? So these two guys cancel, the 30,000s cancel. So, so far we have the $6,000 outflow. But then when they sell the electronic units, they get 22.5. Is that a cash inflow or outflow? That's an inflow, right? And so, based upon that, the gain is 16,500. Now, you might go, wow, that's incredible. You know, but look, I made up the numbers, okay? I'm not trying to. Uh, get across the point of, wow, what an amazing profit. Put in 6000 and and your profit was sixteen five. dollars um, My point is, is it profitable? Would an American entrepreneur be incentivized to engage in this activity? They would, right? Now, by the way, we'll, we'll revisit this, but for now, just make a mental note. Where is food being purchased with the activities of the American entrepreneur? In the United States or in Mexico? In the United States, right? And where's electronics being purchased? In the United States or Mexico? In Mexico. Okay, so so just just remember that. Okay, so so um, USA, you know, so far, food and Mexico electronics. Okay, so so in 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 the USA, food is being purchased. And in Mexico, electronics is being purchased. Just make a mental note of that. Okay, so now let's look at the Mexican entrepreneur. And I'll go through this a little bit quicker since it's sort of similar concept. So, so they buy 75 electronic units in Mexico at the price in Mexico of 300, uh, 400 pesos per unit. That comes to needing 30,000 pesos. So is that a cash inflow or outflow? Outflow, right? And so what are they going to do with those electronic units? Well, they just bought them in Mexico, so presumably they'll sell them in, in the U.S. They're not going to turn around and sell them back in Mexico. And so at the various prices, they get twenty-two five. What are they going to do with those dollars? What's the only thing they can do with those dollars? Since we haven't made any assumptions about an exchange rate. Well, they could buy food, right? And with that many dollars, they can get 3750 pounds of food, given these prices. Then they're going to ship them to Mexico. And so if we look at the cash inflow, outflow, the, the dollars cancel, right? That's, a, uh, that's an inflow, that's an outflow. But the 30,000 pesos they needed originally to buy the electronic units, that's an outflow. But they get an inflow of 112,500. So, so again, they've made money. 
and, and again, note, okay, you know, with the American entrepreneur, in the, where was food purchased? In the U.S., right? So what about here with the Mexican entrepreneur? Where, where is food being purchased? In the U.S., right? And what about Mexico? Where, is, where are the electronics being purchased? In Mexico, right? Okay, so same, same thing. In both cases, all food is being purchased in the U.S., and all electronics is being purchased in Mexico. So we're, we're going to need to remember that in a minute. In any case, for now, what we know is that, hey, the American made money, and the Mexican made money. So did free trade therefore benefit society? Well, how did we define benefit, right? We define it by a higher standard of living. How do we define society? Well, American and U.S. citizens. What we know at this point is that one American citizen and one Mexican citizen made money. Does that necessarily mean that society benefited? It doesn't, right? So at this point, have we shown that society on average have benefited? We haven't, right? What we need to do, presumably, is compare standard of living, and we haven't done that. So we'll get to that, but, but my only point right now is the only thing we've done is that we've illustrated what? That there is or is not an incentive to trade. That there is an incentive to trade. You know, trade if it's profitable, and this shows it's profitable. So let's get back to this point a minute. You know, where was all the food purchased? Remember that? All the food was purchased in the United States, right? So if all the food is purchased in the United States, where must it all be made? In the United States, right? And what about electronics? Where, where was all that purchased? In Mexico, right? So, so where must all the electronics be made? In Mexico, right? So let's think about this. So before free trade, in the U.S., both food and electronics were being made, and now just food. So what's happened to all the electronic workers in the, U in the U.S.? Well, they've lost their jobs. They've had to become farmers, if you will. And what about the farmers in Mexico? What, what's happened to their jobs? They've lost their jobs. You know, they've had to become electronic workers. You know, in the ivory tower of, of, uh, of a classroom, we'll say, well, that's a displacement cost. But in, in reality, it, 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 can this be devastating? Yeah. I mean, uh, take uh, Akron, Ohio, for example. That used to be known as the, the rubber capital of the world, you know, with tires. And, 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 and now I, I don't even know if there's, there's one plant left there. Maybe there's one. I'm not sure. Because all of that business went overseas, as I recall, Asia. And so Akron, Ohio, or places like that, they had to totally reinvent themselves. And, and it's easy for you and me to talk about displacement costs, but you, you could have had you know, your, your, your grandfather and your father, and now you, and you've been working in the, in the tire factory all your life, and boom, now that opportunity is gone. And, and, and when, you know, when a whole industry leaves and a, and a, and a city is so d dependent on, on that particular industry, what, what happens to the grocery stores and the banks and the price of real estate? And is, is there a ripple effect? There is, right? A and it may take a whole generation. It might just take two years. It might take five. It might take 10, 20. Your point is, is that can change be costly? It can be, right? And so here's another why, or you know, a what followed by a why. So to the extent that NAFTA did pass, and to the extent that it was really close, what do you think had to be part of the bill? I'm not saying this is a good or a bad thing, but just this is logic here. What do you think had to be part of the bill to make it more palatable to pass from a political perspective? Well, what was part of the bill is the government kicking in 
subsidies for, for retraining. So, so in the context of this example, you know, hey, if you're an electronics worker and you lost your job, we, the government, you know, we'll give you a certain amount of money to set you up and to train you how to be farmers and so on and so forth. So again, I'm not saying that's a good or a bad thing, but that would be the logic for why something like that would be included in the bill. So let's proceed with, uh, with the, the true way of figuring out whether or not society on average benefited. So what do you think happened to prices and wages? Do you think they remained static or do you think that they changed? Well, well, presumably they changed. And we're going to make the assumption. Assumption. Again, I, I really stress assumptions because you, you need to understand assumptions when you bridge theory with practice or, or when you say, hey, yes, because of this assumption, this would more likely hold in the real world for this particular product than for another product or whatever it is that you're applying it to. So, so we're just going to assume that prices will adjust until there are no longer any arbitrage opportunities. And, and by what do I mean by that? So for example, when the American entrepreneur got into this, she, she forked out $6,000 and got back twenty two five dollars and so made a profit of $16,500. For me to say that prices adjust until there are no longer any arbitrage opportunities, well, well, first of all, do you think other people would jump on that bandwagon? They probably would, right? And the more people that jumped on that bandwagon, do you think the profits would get even bigger or they, they would be squeezed closer and closer and become less and less? Probably less and less, right? And so we're going to assume that for no arbitrage opportunities that those profits go to what? Zero dollars. So what I'm going to do is I'm not going to tell you how I calculated this. I'm simply going to illustrate that at these prices that there are no longer any arbitrage opportunities. So we got food at $9 a pound and, and 27 pesos and electronics at $250 a unit and 750 pesos per unit. If you want, you know, maybe, maybe pause and, and write these numbers down or whatever. So let's look at the American entrepreneur with these new prices. So same thing, you know, she buys a thousand pounds of food in the US at the new price of $9 a pound, it's going to cost 9000 Takes the food over to Mexico, sells it with the new prices, that's 27,000 pesos. With those 27,000 pesos, now you're able to buy 36 electronic units with the new prices. And, and then they ship them to the U.S. and, and you can get $9,000. And so we have right here, Cash inflow or outflow for buying the food? Outflow. The 27,000 pesos, you know, they cancel. And then they sell the units back in the U.S. for $9,000. So, so what was the profit? It was zero, right? Now, what about wages? Let's do this with food. Now, for the U.S., that is. Now, why, why am I doing this with food for the U.S.? Well, are there any electronic workers in the U.S.? There aren't, right? So, so I got to I got to use food data. So, basically, nine dollars a pound represents just the labor component or the total price. The total price, right? So we've got <coughs> uh, we've got nine dollars. Excuse me, one minute. Nine dollars per pound. So that nine dollars per pound for food is the total price. And what percentage did we say represented the labor component? Two thirds, right? Well, what's two thirds of nine dollars? Six dollars, right? So we've got six dollars per pound. Um, is six dollars per pound is the labor component, okay, of this of this food, right? Now, as far as productivity is concerned, 
we said that an American can produce two pounds in one hour, right? So, so six dollars for, for, for one pound, well, how many dollars is that for two pounds? Twelve dollars, right? So, twelve dollars for two pounds. So, so in other words, the American can produce two pounds of food in one hour, and the labor cost component of that is twelve dollars. So therefore, what is the wage per hour? Twelve dollars an hour, right? So, you know, otherwise put, you know, twelve dollars of labor produces two pounds of food, so it takes six dollars of labor to produce one pound of food. So, so now we have, we have uh, prices and we have wages in the U.S. And what I'd like you to do is to use the same logic and, and figure out the, the Mexican wage. And when you do that, are you going to use food data or electronics data? Well, what are they, uh, wh where are all the electronics being purchased? In Mexico, right? And so, where are all the electronics being made? In Mexico, right? Is there any food being uh, farmed in Mexico? It's not, right? So we use electronics or food data to calculate the Mexican wage. You'll use electronics data. So, so if, you, if, if you're unable to get that 15 pesos, pesos per hour, then, then rewind a little bit and go through the logic of the, of the American wage, and, and that'll make sure this is solidif solidifies your understanding. So bottom line, we have wages in the U.S. at $12 an hour. We have wages in Mexico at 15 pesos per hour. So we now have both price and wage information. And with that, can I now go, hey, work for one hour in the U.S. and, and this is how much bread I buy. We can, right? So for example, in the U.S. I make $12 in one hour. And if you recall, the price for food was how much, you remember? It was $9 per pound. So what that means is I get $12, I only need nine to buy a pound, so I get $3 and change, and, and again, that'll buy me another third of a pound of food, so 12 divided by nine. And with that, can I basically do the same thing with everything? I can, right? I can basically apply the same logic to all these boxes. So, so here we have, after free trade, what one hour of work will buy. And let's compare that to before. Okay, so in the U.S., can I buy more food than before? I can't, right? In both cases, you know, before and after free trade, one and a third pounds. But, but has the standard of living gone down? hasn't. It's just remained the same for bread, right? What about electronics? Can I, can I buy more iPhones than before or fewer? I can buy more, right? So overall, has the standard of living in the U.S. gone up or gone down? It's increased. What about in Mexico? Before I could buy, you know, about 0.3 pounds of bread and now it's about 0.6. So, so can I buy more bread than before in Mexico? I can, right? And what about electronics? Well, it looks like that's remained the same. But overall, has the sound living gone up or gone down in Mexico? It's gone up, right? So, so the bottom line, at least with the with the assumptions or, or the the numbers I've made up, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, it does or it does not appear that in both Mexico and in the U.S the standard of living has gone up. Well, it, it's, it, it, it does. It does appear that way. Work for one hour, and you can buy more stuff in both countries than before. Now, this is not a, an explanation. This is just a name. Okay? And, and we'll get into a, a logical explanation in a minute. But does anybody know the name of the concept that explains why the U.S. produces food and Mexico produces electronics. 
Well, the name of the concept is, is relative comparative advantage. Okay? So, so, for example, in the U.S., they can produce food more or less efficiently than in Mexico. More efficiently, right? In fact, if we compare the two to the point four, it's five times more efficient, right? So maybe I'll maybe I'll write that down. Okay, so U.S. food five times more efficient. Now, what about Mexico? Mexico with the electronics. Well, the U.S. is still relatively more efficient. Um, and, uh, you know, let me, let me rewrite this. Okay, so U.S. food five times more efficient. U.S. electronics only 1.33 times more efficient. Okay, so, so the U.S. is relatively more efficient at producing food or relatively more efficient at producing electronics. It's relatively more efficient at producing food. And so what we would say is that we would say that the U.S. enjoys a relative comparative advantage in food. But is that a relative comparative advantage or disadvantage at electronics? The U.S. would be at a relative comparative disadvantage with electronics. Okay, when it comes to absolute comparative advantage, the U.S. enjoys an absolute comparative advantage in, in both food and electronics. They do, right? But on a relative basis, what you would say is the U.S. is at a relative comparative advantage with food and is at a relative comparative disadvantage with electronics. And conversely, Mexico is at a relative comparative advantage with what? Electronics, but at a relative comparative disadvantage with food. And, and again, that, that's just a name, okay? It doesn't, it doesn't explain why this is happening, but it's just a name that is applied to the fact that the U.S. basically got the farming industry in this example, and Mexico got the electronics industry. So we'll get into logic as to why that's the case in a minute. But one of the things I said was, well, why is this topic so fiercely debated? So for example, why would a congressperson from California be for NAFTA, while one from Michigan might be against it? I mean, I'm not saying this is true, but I'm, I'm, so I'm making up the example. But what, what would, if you were going to use the term relative comparative advantage, what, what would you guess? If it was true that a congressperson from California was going, yeah, we should do NAFTA, and, and Michigan was going, no, we don't want NAFTA, what, what would you guess was true about the kind of industries that were in their states? Or would it make sense that a congressperson from California would say yes to NAFTA if, if California was dominated with industries that enjoyed a relative comparative advantage? It would, right? And, and so, so may, maybe they would be a net gainer of jobs. And if, you, if, you, if, if politicians vote on stuff that gains jobs in their states, are they more likely or less likely to get reelected? probably more likely, right? And maybe, you know, so California with the, the Silicon Valley and, 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 you know, some leading edge technologies, maybe even wine, uh, you know, maybe they're going, yeah, yeah, we, we like this NAFTA stuff, but maybe Michigan, maybe they're going, whoa, hang on, we've got, we've got the, the, the big three and the big three are rapidly becoming the, the little three and they've got all this global competition. We'd, we'd rather have, comp we'd rather have protection. And uh, so, you know, there's, no, we, we don't like NAFTA at all. Again, I'm just making that up. But the, the point is, is that a, a logical explanation, or at least a, a name that could be applied to why it's so fiercely debated, 
is, well, am I going to be a net loser as a state or a net gainer? But what about U.S. presidents? You know, some would say that, you know, U.S. presidents, and, you know, it's obviously not a completely clean record. You know, if you take every single action, you could say some were prone, some were against free trade, but probably not a out of the woods thing to suggest that for a long time, U.S. presidents, on average, have engaged in actions that supported trade. I mean, whether we're talking about Democrats or Republicans. So, for example, Nixon, in in the early '70s, I, I, yeah, he he made a historic trip to China to try to open up, you know, more trade relations. Um, if you look at, uh, um, you know, you know, both Bushes, you know, Bush Jr. and Bush Senior. I mean, but both of them were uh, passing free trade laws and. And again, I, I realized there were actions that uh, were not uh, supportive of free trade. Um, but probably on average, I'm guessing most would say, yeah, on average, they seem to engage in actions that supported free trade. Um, who, who, was, uh, who was the president when NAFTA was passed? Clinton. Okay, Democrat. And so here's my question for you. Why might a U.S. president whether they're Democrats or Republicans, why, why might they be motivated to support free trade? Well, is a president more likely or less likely going to get reelected if the economy is doing better? Presumably more likely, right? And so if, if it is true that free trade on average benefits society, on average people's standard of living go up, and remember, the president is responsible for all the states combined. Then, do you think that it would be a motivation for them to support or oppose free trade? Presumably, a motivation to support it. Okay, so what I want to do now is essentially critique this model. I mean, we made a lot of assumptions, right? And I made up all these fancy numbers. Hey, may, maybe my goal is to brainwash you, right? May, maybe all of this stuff just works with these numbers. But bo bottom line is, is it fair or unfair to say that, that given the numbers I did make up and given the assumptions that we did apply, is it fair or unfair to say that the standard of living rose in both countries? That's a fair thing to say, right? But now, let's say that you are the advisor to the president or, you know, to whoever's in charge of your country or whatever, and, and you're advising him on, on this whole issue, this highly debated issue of trade, and you come up with this model. Would you, would you at least want to either find logic that supports or rejects the outcome of this model? Well, presumably you would, right? So can any of you think of a, a logical reason, something that's qualitative, something that just doesn't depend upon all these numbers that I've made up that would be consistent with the outcome, and that is that the standard of living went up in both countries? I mean, th think about this. In fact, you know, if, if I were you, I'd, I'd pause and... and and, and just think if you can come up with a, a logical explanation on, on either direction that, that supports or refutes it. Well, what, what about this? L let me take you, okay? How many hours are in your day? Well, if you're like me, there's 24 hours in your day, right? And, and what, about, what about your bank account? Is that unlimited or is there, is there a limited amount of money in your bank account? Well, presumably there's a limited amount of money, right? And, and so from that perspective, would it be fair to say that you, you as an individual, have limited resources? You only have so many hours in the day, so much money in your bank, and, and so on and so forth. It's probably reasonable, right? And what I find that when I teach this course, there's so much that you can, 
you can look at on an individual level and then just multiply by 200 million or whatever, you know, it's aggregated and apply it at the country level. And so if it's true that you have limited resources, is it also true that the U.S., for example, has limited resources? That's true, right? And so here's my question for you. If you allocate your limited resources more efficiently, what does your intuition tell you? Does your intuition tell you that, hey, you know, I can enjoy a higher standard of living or a lower standard of living? Well, I'm guessing your intuition tells you you can enjoy a higher standard of living. And so we'll get more into that, but let me just illustrate with an example. I mean, even right now, I mean, the fact that you're watching this means you're either doing it for the sake of learning or, or you're getting a degree. Are you allocating your own personal resource right now? You are, right? And, and are, you, are you hoping to, do you think of that as an investment? Are you hoping that it'll lead to a, a better life down the road to some degree? Well, maybe you are. You know, maybe you're getting your bachelor's degree. Maybe you're getting your master's degree. You know, whatever it is, right now you are allocating your own personal resource. And if it's being efficiently allocated, your intuition is probably telling you, well, that'll result in a higher standard of living. But, but here, here's the bottom line, okay? Excuse me one minute. Is it fair to say that the U.S. has limited resources? Okay, so that's, that's probably a fair thing to say, right? So the U.S. has limited resources. Now, before free trade, they were forced to allocate those limited resources into what two activities in this example? Food and electronics, right? So, food and electronics. So, food and electronics. Now, of those two, which was the higher return activity, the food or the electronics? The food, Rose, right? So in other words, before free trade, because trade was not allowed, the U.S. had to take its limited resources, and, and that's important, right? Because if, if the U.S. had unlimited resources, then this argument doesn't hold. So the U.S. had to take its limited resources and basically allocate them into, if you will, high return activities and low rate return activities. Well, what about after free trade? Well, after free trade, the U.S. was able to take its limited resources and apply them all to just the high return activity. Now, is that a more efficient use or allocation of resources, do you think, or less efficient? Well, probably more efficient, right? So, so he, he, here's another point, okay? So, so what, what we've argued so far is that essentially, is it fair to say that when a country allocates its resources, say its, its assets, which are limited, more efficiently versus less efficiently, does that result, does that result in a higher standard of living, which I've denoted SOL there. And, and presumably the intuition is, is, is yes, but let's, let's think about this just a little bit more before I give you, hey, if you can handle it, you know, one more C story. And that is, we have the government and we have the market, okay? When, when, when the free trade law was passed, in what direction was power flowing? From the government to the market or from the market to the government? Well, presumably from the government to the market. Right? Because the government was saying, hey, 
you know what? <laughs> we don't care about you, market. No trade allowed. Everything happens within the United States. Or well, everything happens within Mexico. And then as soon as the government said, hey, you know what? Let trade flow if that's what the market wants to do. So my point is, is that now who has more control over how limited resources are allocated after the free trade law? Would it be the government or would it be the market? It would be the market, right? And if, if you believe that on average the market allocates resources more efficiently than less efficiently, you know, compared to the government, if you believe that, I'm not saying that's true or not true, but if you believe the market does a better job of allocating resources more efficiently, then what does your intuition tell you about the impact on standard living? Higher standard living or lower standard living? Well, presumably lower standard living. I mean, higher standard living. Now, you might believe that the government, on average, allocates resources more efficiently, and 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 that's that's fine. I mean, you know, people always make fun of the post office. Well, I'm amazed that you know we have this unbelievable amount of mail that exists in the world, and it actually makes it to my mailbox. I, I'm so I, I'm I'm relatively impressed, and and. Um, and, and so may, maybe there are some, but most people criticize, you know, the government's handling of the post office. Um, what about defense? And no, it's, you know, maybe there, there are some things that the government's great at allocating. But my point is that if you believe that the market, on average, allocates resources more efficiently than the government, then free trade, is that shifting the power to the market? It is, Right. And then that would be consistent or inconsistent with the standard of living going up if you believe the market allocates resources more efficiently. That'd be consistent, right? So, so what I want to do, what I want to do now, this is a sort of a sea story, is I want to talk about the relationship between how efficient a country's assets are are used or how, how efficiently resources are being allocated and this standard living, you know, prosperity. So, so I'm going to give you a, uh, you know, just sort of a, a sea story, right, if you can handle that. And uh, so I'm going to talk, this is going to be a tale about two, two countries and, and two cities, if you will. And, um, and so I'm going to talk about the assets are going to be the port of Galveston, Texas. This is back in the 80s. I actually did two trips to Mogadishu, Somalia. And the uh, uh, it was what's called handshake cargo. And, and the story is going to relate to, well, how efficiently are assets managed in the port of Galveston. And we'll look at the standard living in Galveston at the time. And we'll relate that to how efficiently the assets are being managed in the port of Mogadishu. And at the time, what the standard of living was like in Mogadishu. So, so the point of this story is, you know, the more efficiently assets are managed, you know, does that ceteris paribus result in a higher standard of living? Okay, and it's just anecdotal. It's just just a story, um, but uh, but 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 maybe it'll it'll make sense. So, so he, he, here I am, you know, talking about Galveston, Texas, right now. And um, you're going to see how badly my art is now. But basically, we're loading food, right? H handshake cargo. D does anybody, by the way, know what handshake cargo is? It was basically U.S. tax-provided uh, um, cargo. And, and I've got, I got to draw you a quick drawing about how you load this on, onto a ship. And, and this is where you're going to see how poorly I draw. Um, but in any case, uh, just drawing the ship right now. Um, so, uh, sorry about that. Okay, so so the the, the way it worked is, <laughs> sorry, yeah, this is really bad. So so there's the ship, and there are the hatches, and and these are all um, these are all slings with 
pound you know, bags of food. You know, there might be 50 pound bags or whatever. And so what would have to happen is that this tractor would have to be directly across from the hatch so the crane could load it in and, and unload it. And so, so the tractor would, might move it forward a foot and then the next sling could go off and so on and so forth. And so in Galveston, there were the right number of, of dock workers, presumably, and the right number of tractors and, and, and people like me on the ship and et cetera, et cetera. And, and so uh, this is a ship, this is a freighter, this is about two football fields in length. And it took about a week to load that ship. Okay, so so here, here's my question to you. On average, do you think it takes longer to load a ship or unload a ship? Well, what about when you go on vacation? Does it take you longer to pack or to unpack? Probably takes you longer to pack, right? Because you've got to figure out what you're going to take. You have to fold it. You have to know where to put it in your suitcase. If you're like me, you get to the your destination, your vacation, and boom, 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 and in in two minutes you're unpacked. Okay, well with the ship it's similar. You you got to know where you go, you're going to put all that stuff in the in the in the hatches, and then you got to secure it, and and et cetera, et cetera. And and when you get to the other end, it, it takes much less time to loosen the chains and unsecure everything, and to unload it. At least on average, that's true. So it took us a week to load this stuff in Galveston, representing in this story how efficiently assets are managed. How long do you think it took to unload the ship in Mogadishu, Somalia? Well, it took about a month. And you might be going, whoa, a month? Are you kidding? Yeah, well, first of all, we travel the 8,000 miles or whatever it is, and we're within two miles of the port. And, and we put out anchor. And, and first of all, we had to spend the first 10 days just sitting there, doing nothing. Now, why do you think that was? Why, why were we just sitting there doing nothing? Well, you might say customs, or maybe the port was full. And No, in fact, there was just one ship. You could see the port from where we were. And there were plenty of open spaces. Well, you know, this is a good law, you know, and we have it in the United States, but basically it's a law that when you go into a port that a, a local pilot will come on board the ship because they know the tides and the currents and how deep everything is, that they, they have much better local knowledge, and so they'll bring that ship in to the specific uh, port and dock the ship. And so, guess what? The port of Mogadiscio only had one pilot, and he was on vacation. Efficient or inefficient allocation of resources? Inefficient, right? I mean, here you've got all this capital and these highly paid um, American officers and sailors and so on and so forth just sitting there doing nothing because one pilot was on vacation. That, that's, you know, most people I think would agree that's not a very efficient management of assets. So then we finally get into the port, and even then it took another 20 days to unload that ship. Any guesses as to why? Well, it turns out that that port only had one tractor. And so you spent most of the time waiting for a tractor. I mean, you had you had natives that would you know, you try to use planks to, to inch this forward six inches or whatever. But as far as trying to line up the, the, um, the hatch with where the bags would be unloaded, uh, most of the, the vast majority of the time was just spent waiting. And so efficient or inefficient management of assets. Inefficient, right? So here we have Galveston, you know, efficiently managed port. We have Mogadiscio, inefficiently managed port. Now let's compare the two standard livings. Well, in Galveston, at the time, if you had a, a black and white TV instead of a color TV, you weren't doing too well, just as an illustration. In, in contrast, 
you walked the, the streets of Mogadishu at the time, and, and I know they had the tourist hotels and stuff, but you're talking about mud huts and no electricity and, and no you know, flowing water, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, clearly, without question, at the time, and um, maybe today too, I don't know, but clearly without question at the time, because I lived in Galveston, I, I know what the standard of living was there, there was like, and I walked around the port of Mogadishu, Galveston had a much higher standard of living. And so that's an anecdotal example that relates to how efficiently a country's assets are managed and its standard of living. And of course, there's, you know, less anecdotal. I mean, you can take, for example, the uh, Wall Street Journal in conjunction with the uh, American Heritage Foundation. Every year they come out with what's called an index of economic freedom. And they use a bunch of criteria to relate freedom to how prosperous a country is. Okay, so freedom, and, and, and this is not exactly tied to just free trade. Um, I'll, just, I'll just keep it simple. So freedom and prosperity. But of course, free trade is one of the things that's, that's in this whole index. And so they, they, they rank countries from you know, mostly free to mostly unfree. And, and what relationship do you think they find on average? Of course, there are exceptions. Well, they basically find you know, that, that kind of relationship. The, the more economically free a country is, of which free trade would be one component, the more prosperous the country is. And, and, and you might think, well, well, what if it's the rich who are benefiting from the poor? Well, they've also looked at that. And, and, and what would you imagine? Would you rather be poor, for example, in the United States? Or would you rather be poor in North Korea? And, and, and so the poor in, in North Korea would, would much rather, um, I'm ignoring politics here, I'm just talking about standard living. The poor in North Korea would, from a standard living perspective, much rather be poor in the United States. So that's, that's sort of a less anecdotal example. So that's a qualitative discussion about the logic that in this case supports the numbers I made up. But we still need to make f fun of this model. We, we still need to critique it because it's, it's really just incredibly uh, simple, right? Only two countries and only two goods, etc., etc. So what would you look at? If you, if you wanted to, let's say you're an advisor to, again, the, the president or the minister in your country or whatever, and you say, hey, you know, here's this model. It shows that people on average, benefit or enjoy a higher standard of living with freer trade. And, and, and here's some logic that supports it. You know, we have limited resources. So if we allocate those limited resources more efficiently, you'd, you'd expect a higher standard of living. But even that's not enough. What, what would you, you could still critique the model as being too simple. What can you think of that would make you think, well, you know, uh, how do we know this applies to the real world? Well, what about looking at data in the real world, right? So, for example, this whole um, this whole index of economic freedom, you could look at real world data at a point in time. So you could rank countries from you know unfree trade to totally free trade, and then you could relate it to some kind of proxy for standard living. Maybe that's GDP per capita or whatever. And, and as I mentioned, it, it's not direct because there are other things that this index has, but the, the data suggests that there is a correlation between how economically free a country is and the prosperity, say, GDP per capita. Now, is that proof or merely supportive evidence? Well, that, that's just merely supportive evidence, right? It's, it's not proof. Now, not only could you look at real-world data at a point in time, but you could look at different countries over a period of time. So, for example, um, 
I'm just going to say, hang on, 1945, so after World War II, then let's say, you know, 1985, and, and then we'll go all the way to today. Okay, so here we have 1945 to 1985, so a 40 year period, and then we've got this gap today. So, so here's my question to you. Let's say this is the US. In what period of time do you think that we've made more, uh, we've made trade freer? In these first 40 years or, or, or these, these latter few decades? Well, I, I haven't read this. I, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm guessing that the graph would look something like this. Okay, something like that. In other words, you know, more, more progress in this latter, smaller period than in the first 40 years after World War II. I mean, we've had you know, NAFTA and all kinds of freer trade agreements in the U.S. that have happened since then. And so, why would that be the case? Well, well, well let me ask you this, okay? Um, I'm going to put two lines here, or make two points. Government versus political, your know, market versus economic. Okay, so, so again, I, I realize these two aren't completely mutually exclusive, but during this class I'm often going to be referring to these two as different entities. But again, when freer trade is passed, in what direction is power going in? From the government to the market, or from the market to the government? from the government to the market, right? So we've got power, we've got power flowing in that direction with the freer trade. So, is that typical? I mean, do, 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 you, uh, do you often think of politicians as saying, yeah, we want to give up power? Or does that seem to be contrary to what you'd expect. Well, it, it's a matter of opinion. But, it, but here's a thought process, okay? Just, just a school of thought, that's all. And that is that if it is true that, uh, that free trade does on average benefit society and more and more countries start jumping, if you will, on that free trade bandwagon, then does it become politically more costly to deny your people that opportunity for a higher standard of living? And you could argue that it would, right? Because after all, people knew about this free trade thing long before 1945. I mean, Adam Smith, right? When did he write his Wealth of Nations? 1800 something? So, so this, this is not news. But, but what would make sense with this sort of exponential free, freedom of trade is the fact that, you know, jumping on that bandwagon or, or not jumping on that bandwagon is becoming politically increasingly costly. And so that would only be true if it's true that freer trade results, ceteris paribus, on average, in a higher standard of living. So let me let me discuss just a couple of things, you know, a few few quotes or whatever, and 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 then and then what we'll do is we'll look at the exchange rate because we haven't still haven't seen the exchange rate, and uh, then we'll call it a day. So environmentalists are generally against free trade because some corporations will shift production to countries with the lowest environmental restrictions. True or false? That's presumably true, right? I mean, if I'm a if I'm a CEO of Widgets Incorporated, and in the United States it costs me twenty cents to make that widget because, you know, fifteen of those cents are because of environmental restrictions, and I could go to Mexico and and I could avoid, you know, maybe all the environmental restrictions and make it for only five cents, then would it not be my fiduciary responsibility? to Ceteris Paribus, shifted all to Mexico? 
do all my pollution there? It would, right? I mean, so, so yeah, it, it's hard to argue against this. So what about a counter-argument? Can anyone give me a counter-argument in which, in the long run, however you define that, I don't know how you define that, maybe that's a year, maybe it's 50 years, but in the long run, however you define that, where the environment would actually benefit by freer trade. Well, what kind of country do you think can afford or better afford environmental restrictions? Richer or poorer countries? Well, presumably richer, right? I mean, that makes logical sense, but the research also shows that that's true. So, for example, if you're maybe Bangladesh and you're having a tough time feeding your people and so on and so forth, are they going to pile on a bunch of environmental restrictions? Probably not, right? And so, if it is true that freer trade makes a country more prosperous, then are they more likely or less likely down the road to start putting in environmental restrictions? Well, presumably more likely. And, and that would be a counter-argument for how freer trade in the long run would benefit the environment. And I'm not saying that you should buy it or not buy it. it it's just, again, a thought process. You know, again, my goal is for you to see different sides of the issue, and then you decide. All right, here's another one. Inexpensive labor generates a competitive disadvantage for the U.S. business in a free trade environment. Well, what do you think? Well, I guess I guess it can, but but I guess but could it also be an advantage? I mean, I mean first of all, when it comes to uh, a product, say, is labor the only component? It's not, right? There's there's land and there's cap there's capital. But but even if we focus just on the labor, could Walmart, for example, be what it is today? without actually celebrating the differences that occur just because you cross a border. So, for example, Walmart's business model has thrived on doing what? Well, hey, I, I'm Walmart and, and I'm going to go buy a bunch of stuff from China because China has really cheap labor. So when it comes to making toys and, and so on and so forth, and, and, and maybe the next free, um, you know, cheap labor country is, is Vietnam or Thailand or, or whatever it is. But I, I'm, I'm basically going to follow the bouncing ball and have this stuff made that's labor intensive where it's cheap and then, and then sell it throughout the world. And so, so is it fair to say that Walmart actually thrived because of the fact that there are differences in what different countries have to offer? It did, right? So, so Walmart's an example of, of celebrating the differences, in this case, cheap labor, as opposed to being threatened by them. Let's look at another one. Less developed countries cannot compete in international trade because they are less productive than the developed countries. Well, is that true? I mean, as long as any country has some kind of relative comparative advantage, do they have something to offer? Can, can they, by definition, compete? Presumably they can, right? I mean, it, it, I, I cannot, if, if there's a country with zero relative comparative advantage, I, I question whether it'd even be habitable. If you have absolutely nothing to offer, so, for example, you might say, well, what about Greece? You know, they're, they, you know, they've been really struggling. Well, well, does Greece have nothing to offer? No, they have all kinds of stuff to offer, right? I mean, Greece is beautiful. They have beauty, they have olives, yeah, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we can talk more about Greece, but, you know, b b bottom line is as long as a, a country has something to offer, so think in terms of relative comparative advantage, then, then by definition, 
they can potentially compete. I mean, look at China, right? If you look at China over the long run, I used to, when I was in China, okay, final sea story. When I was in China and my ship went through the Gulf of Pohei and into the port of, I think it's called Xinjiang, uh, which is near Beijing. So I went ashore into Beijing. And so this would have been uh, the early 80s. And Beijing had traffic jams. I mean, I, I couldn't go from, from here to 20 feet away because it was totally jammed with traffic. And, and what do you think the traffic jam consisted of? Bicycles. Just a complete solid sea of bicycles. Now you go to Beijing and, and what do the traffic jams consist of? Cars. China's been competing. I don't know if you'd call them a less developed country anymore. So, you know, certainly the cities look glorious. Of course, you go out to rural China and it, it's a different story. Which, uh, but, uh, <clears throat> but, you know, in fact, apparently, you know, companies are, are moving more and more inland to take advantage of the cheap labor that they have to offer. So what about the exchange rate? We said that this whole trading thing, that that was a... Uh, a, a condition, exchange rate was a condition. And when we talked about the food and electronics, did we ever have to come up with an exchange rate? We didn't, right? But maybe it's an outcome. So for example, if we take food, the price of the food in the US ended up being $9 a pound. In Mexico, 27 pesos per pound. If we look at a diagram of that, then based on the assumptions that we have, for this same item of food, should I be able to take my $9 to Mexico and exchange it for 27 pesos to get the same loaf of bread? Well, if I should, then what would the exchange rate be? Three pesos per dollar, right? Now again, just to illustrate, hey, under what circumstances or you know, do, do assumptions provide you with judgment to say, hey, this, this would be true for this type of thing and not true for that kind of thing. Um, would this be true for five-star hotel rooms? So in other words, if I took a five-star hotel room in New York City and say a five-star hotel room in, in Thailand, uh, do you think that after I adjusted for exchange rates that they would cost the same? It probably wouldn't, right? Let's say in Thailand, it's relatively cheap to stay in a hotel given the exchange rate. And in, in New York, it's relatively expensive. Well, that price isn't adjusting, but let's compare it to something else. Let's say oil. Let's say oil was relatively cheap to buy in, in Thailand and, and relatively expensive to sell in the U.S., would that be a motivation for somebody to take a tanker and go to Thailand and buy it and then take it to New York and sell it? It would, right? And if everybody was buying in Thailand and selling in New York, what do you think would happen to the price of oil in Thailand if everybody's buying it? It'd probably go up, right? And if everybody's selling in New York, it would do what? Probably go down, right? In other words, prices would have the opportunity to adjust until they're no longer any arbitrage opportunities. And that's an assumption that we made in this thing. And that's, then that's an example of why it's so important to understand these assumptions, because only if you understand the assumptions, then you can use reasonable judgment to say under what circumstances the concept would and would not apply in the real world. In any case, we'll, we'll talk more about uh, a, a model that, that looks at you know, th this way of figuring out an exchange rate later on in the class. But like I said, you know, our goal in the first half of this class is to, well, the theme is understand financial principles as it affects firm value. And value is a function of what two things? Risk and return. And the element of risk that we're focusing on in particular in the first half exchange rate risks. And, and so, so this was why we did what we did today. You know, we want to understand why 
the dollar goes up and down in value. We want to understand this risk. And so now we see how free trade plays a role in exchange rates. So I hope this was a good learning experience. And hopefully I'll see you at the next lecture. This is James Tompkins. Take care.